So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Cocos Lectures. Today we will get on to our second module uh, and we'll talk in particular about data management via views and we'll talk about execution and memory spaces, how to control where to allocate data, where to execute code and things like that. Can we get muted on whoever's not muted there? Okay, so uh, before we get started here again, the uh, online resources we have available, uh, you know, as always the primary Cocos GitHub organization, if you weren't here last time, you know, that's where you find all of our things. Uh, one thing new, I created that after the last module, as of the last week's lecture, um, in the Cocos tutorials repo, there's now Wiki and in where you find the Cocos lecture series. Uh, Wiki. And that is where we put, uh, you know, links to slides, recordings, question and answers and stuff like that. So, you know, if you want to see the recording, etc., you know, see the answers to questions which came up, you know, please go there. Uh, we also have the Wiki for our API reference on, you know, Cocos, on Cocos main repo. And then as always, you know, please join our Slack channel. Uh, that's the fastest way how you can get uh, your questions answered, not just for this lecture, uh, but also for, um, you know, general Cocos questions. And we can whitelist domains, we can invite individual people. So just let us know. Okay, uh, the whole lecture series is that we have, uh, we have eight lectures uh, prepared at this point. And uh, we are now in the second lecture, the views and spaces. Uh, we had last time talked about a number of things. Uh, just as a little recap, we talked about the Cocos ecosystem. We talked about you know, how Cocos gives you a C++ performance portability programming model. Uh, and that you know, there's more than just the core programming model. There's also tools uh, available. There's things like math libraries, et cetera. And uh, we will talk about those things later in this uh, Cocos lectures. Um, also, we talked about how Cocos is supported by multiple national laboratories, how we have a, a, you know, teams dedicated to working on Cocos on a number of big national labs. And that means that there's actually people at the, you know, big uh, computing centers uh, fielding the machines which know about Cocos and how it works on the machines and stuff like that. We talked a lot about building Cocos, how to use uh, CMake, et cetera. We talked about uh, you know, how these options, the uh, Cocos adds to the compiler flex uh, are transitively passed on so that you get all the necessary things for things like uh, CUDA and HIP, et cetera. Uh, we talked a little bit about the spec package manager and how that supports Cocos. And we talked about the you know, ways how to build Cocos in line with your application if you don't really have uh, much of dependencies and want a you know, more contained, self-contained uh, build experience for your users. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the programming model stuff. In particular, we talked about simple data parallelism. Hopefully, you know, you got away from that, that, um, you know, the typical real simple things kind of stay simple. Uh, we talked about parallel patterns and how you use the parallel patterns together with an execution policy to execute computational bodies. Uh, the only execution policy we had so far was a single integer. We'll get more than that today. Uh, we'll talk in particular about simple parallel loops where a parallel four pattern and we talked about reductions uh, which combine contributions from loop iterations and how you use the parallel reduce pattern for that. And as I said, the recording is available. There's a short link for recording down here. Okay, before we come now to the module two, I'm gonna go through the exercise we uh, gave last time. I'm gonna switch here my sharing to a different window. Um, so we said the exercises were in the Cocos tutorials directory. This is uh, what I checked out. I checked this out into my home directory inside of a capitalized Cocos uh, directory. That is kind of what uh, you know all the make files are set up for looking for. Uh, 
And when we go to exercises, there's all these exercises and we were supposed to do exercise one last time. Uh, there's three folders here. There's a begin folder and a solution folder. And in this case, there's a solution extra folder because we had this little extra task for people who were anxious to see, you know, that this actually also can work on uh, GPUs. But what you were supposed to go is you were supposed to go into the begin folder. Uh, there's a CPP file and a make file. If we look at the make file, this is, uh, you know, one of these make files which can build uh, Coco's. Uh, inline and if we look at that you know it's relatively straightforward it tells you where to find uh, cocos that's just the clone of cocos from git directly it sets the cocos devices to openmp uh, and then you know bundles up all the source files in this case there's actually only one source file it sets the compiler and exec and, uh, and uh, cocos architecture in this case it's setting it to broadville and then the most important part here is it includes the makefile.cocos from the cocos directory. And then it adds to its build rules, both for the uh, linking for the executable and for the uh, building of the object files from the CPP files. It adds all these things coming from makefile cocos, like the cocos CPP flags, cocos CXX flags, cocos lips, and stuff like that. So all the all the things you need to modify your build rule so that it actually builds properly. Okay. So when we look in the exercise file, uh, what we said is we need to look for. Uh, comments with capital exercise. That's the places where we have to do something. And if we find the first place where we actually have to do something, you see here, it says we need to initialize the Cocos runtime and include the braces. Um, these braces, we will learn later today what they're actually for. But let's just include that for now. It, this exercise is really simple. I mean, uh, we made it really simple in this case, uh, largely because we usually did these exercises uh, you know, during the lectures, like, you know, actually less of, less of 20 minutes intermittence. Um, okay, so we included Cocos initialize. It works like MPI in it. It just takes the argc and argv, you know, the arguments from, uh, from your main up here, right? And it takes them the same way as MPI. If you had MPI in this code, you would call Cocos initialize right after MPI initialize. Okay, then the next thing it says, uh, convert this outer loop to a Cocos parallel four. This is a completely independent loop, right? There's uh, just initializing a vector uh, or so an array. So we are just gonna make this a parallel four. Good, so that's the first thing. And we said, you know, we want to label these guys. So we'll say, tell this, you know, this is the init y loop. Uh, when we need the loop count, which is just n. And then we need the syntax for uh, creating a lambda. So we capture by value and we'll tell it there's an int i. Yeah. Good. Now the only thing missing is we have now the, the, the lambda here, which is you know the capture clause, the signature of the operator, and the loop body. And the only thing we now need to do is still, we need to close the parallel four call with a parent thesis and a semicolon. Okay, now we can copy that and do that for the next two loops, the initializing X and initializing A loop. Note, if we compare this here, we need the, we need obviously the X here. It wouldn't really matter if you named it the same way. Uh, it would just not, you know, it would conflate the two in like profiling tools. But one thing we need to change is we need to change the M we had here before to the M because that's the loop count for uh, this loop. So let's close that. Let's make that close. Uh, here in init A, it goes again to N, but looking at this loop, the outer loop goes over J. So we need to, or the variable is named J, so we need to name it J. Good. And again, we need to close the Perl 4 call. So that was our initialization calls. When we look for the next exercise, we come to the 
actual you know, loop which is getting timed. And in this case, it's a reduction. If you look here, we have the double result. And for every loop of this J, we sum something up into a result. So this is a simple reduction. So we need to make this, this a parallel reduce. Let's do that. This is the YAX loop. We go to N. Okay. And now we need the capture clause again. And we in J. But because this is a reduction, we need one more thing. We need to uh, have the local reduction variable here. And I often prepend them with an L for local because it's a thread local variable. And I'll just name it now L sum. That means in here, we are now summing up into L sum, not into the final result. Now, we need to close this call again, the parallel reduce, but the parallel reduce takes one more argument. It takes the place where to store the final result, which is result. Okay, that, that loop should be fine. Now we go to the, let's look if there's more of these guys. And yes, there's one more. There's the call to finalize and closing the brace. So we'll do that. And the that, I think we should be almost ready. We overlook one up the top here where we need to include Cocos Core to make this all work. Okay. Let's just look through it again to see if there's any other exercise. We did this, we did this. We did the initialize, we did the Perl 4, we did the next Perl 4, we did the reduce here, we finalized Cocos, and that's it, we're back at the top. Okay, with that, we can build this guy. And what you see is it built Cocos, uh, the Cocos library inline, and, and then it linked it all together at the end. Okay, now let's execute this. And I'll just gonna do the default, Ex uh, you know, run. And one thing you will notice here, so we built for OpenMP, but it's got, it's warning us about not having set uh, the OpenMP uh, bindings. So essentially uh, all the threads are unshackled, you know, and they execute wherever inside the available course on the, on the system. And uh, that is potentially bad because the OS takes a while to you know, uh, schedule the stuff out and uh, you know, essentially your, your threads might just uh, step on each other's toes because we are trying to run on the same uh, core. And it's worse the more threads you have, right? If you're just running on a like you know, four core laptop, you know, usually it's not that bad. If you run on like a dual socket, you know, Skylake with uh, 30 cores each or something like that, you know, uh, it's pretty bad. Actually, in this case, it is pretty bad. And we'll see that in a second. Let's just do what Cocos tells us to do. Set that. And we set that. And run this again. Oh, and where we see a slight difference in performance, we go from 1.3 gigabytes a second to 226 gigabytes a second for this problem. Uh, this thing is running pretty fast because it's a relatively small problem size. So it's actually running out of cache, right? It's running out of L3 cache here. Uh, if we run this a little bit larger, you know, it's actually running in memory. We get closer to what I would expect for the system. Uh, this is a dual socket system with a uh, total 40 cores. And uh, you know, that's roughly what we expect from a band fifth. Now, this was a problem where we ran uh, you know, a large number of rows, 65,000. Uh, one thing we can do is we can reduce the number of rows. So remember, this is power of two. So minus n 10 gives you 1,024. What it did here is because I also give the 26, it kept the problem size the same, 
but it changed the, because I changed the number of rows, it also changed the size of the columns, right? And, uh, you see this kind of inverted it. But I still get the same performance. And uh, you see it's actually pretty quiet, the system getting, you know, decent performance all, all around. Uh, let's reduce that further. This was eight, you know, 256. Uh, that's working still well. And now with seven, you know, 128, you see I'm starting to get, uh, get uh, loose performance here. And if I get down to probably four, uh, at that point, I really lose performance because at this point I'm only using, uh, I only have 16 rows. And then since I uh, paralyzed over that N, you know, I'm not actually using all the cores. So I'm also only using one socket at this point. And uh, that drops the performance. So general answer here is, you know, if you have enough work, you know, because my rows get really large, uh, on CPUs, you know, even having just one iteration per core can actually work. Okay, so there was a second extra task here if you were interested in, and that was uh, replacing, uh, replacing the, the stud mallocs with something, you know, which allows you to run on GPUs. Just to show you what would happen if we were to run this one on GPUs. You know, if I, I can compile this for CUDA, but it will actually first complain about, uh, you know, that it can't compile. And the reason that it complains is here, you see it says this the closure for Lambda, blah, 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 doesn't work and you need some extra flag and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, that is, that is, a, is a problem coming from uh, missing markup. We're gonna talk about that uh, a bit later. For those of you who are aware of CUDA, you know, have used CUDA, essentially the host device markup is missing. Uh, we'll talk about that later today. So this was really just for, you know, extra credit people who wanted to, to actually look this up before. Uh, so I'm just gonna change this for now and explain to you later what's in that. Uh, so we need the Cocos Lambda here. Add that. And again, we'll talk in just a little bit about you know, what's behind that and why we need that. Uh, so let's do that for now. So at this point, it should compile, but when we execute the whole code, it should crash with illegal memory access. Yeah, CUDA error illegal address. The reason that it does that is because we didn't do anything about data management, which is you know largely the topic of today. But what we can do in order to fix that is we can, uh, you know, at, at the simple most point, you know, just replace with a, with a Cobos malloc. So we'll do that. Great. If we replace the Cocos malloc, we also need to replace the stud free with the Cocos free. So it doesn't fail us at the other side. And after we have done that, This code now should, oh, wait, do we do wrong? 183, Cocos, oh. Okay, okay, for the namespace. This code now should compile, and it will also run on the host. This was a bit small, we have only four. 4,000 rows in this case, so let's run a bit larger problem, though I think it actually doesn't matter in performance in this case uh, too much. 
So uh, we're getting here 169 gigabytes a second. I think even making it larger doesn't uh, change that dramatically or at all. Uh, this is a V100. So the, the expected bandwidth you can, you know, the kind of peak bandwidth, which doesn't even, you know, is achieved by, which stream doesn't really achieve, is like 900 gigabytes a second. Um, so this is relatively low. So we would expect here at least 600 gigabytes a second or something like that. Uh, that is if we don't, wouldn't know that there was a problem here. We talked about that and it's the, it's essentially the data layout problem. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that uh, later in this module again and see how to solve that problem. But in principle, this code now, you know, can be compiled for, for the GPU, it can be compiled for, uh, for the CPU. Let's run that back on the CPU and run the post version of this code. And, uh, you know, it runs across both sides, right? And uh, currently it gets, you know, what we expect in bandwidth on the CPU, so it performs well on the CPU. It doesn't perform well on the GPU because we haven't addressed the layout issue yet. So we'll talk, we'll see today, later today, how to do that. Okay, that was it for the exercise. With that, we're gonna go back to our today's module. So today we're gonna to talk about four things. We're gonna talk about Coco's views. What are views, you know, how you create them, why you should use them, uh, what's their life cycle, et cetera. You know, um, what are the things you can do with them? Uh, we are mostly gonna introduce, you know, kind of more of a, the basic side of views. We'll talk more about more advanced things you can do with views uh, next week. Then there's the memory and execution spaces. So we're gonna talk about, you know, how you control their data lifts and how, uh, you know, how you control how uh, their code executes. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the concepts there. Um, we're gonna talk about memory access patterns after that. Uh, in particular, we're gonna show you how to resolve that issue we had right now where you know, while we performed well on the CPU, we didn't get good performance on the, on the GPU. So we're gonna address that. And then as a last point after that, we're gonna come back to the reductions. And, uh, you know, we, we only introduced the basic reduction in this case, which did a summation, right? And we didn't really show you how to do anything elsewhere, right? I mean, you didn't even explicitly say that it's a summation. And we'll talk in advanced reductions a bit, you know, how you go beyond that, how you do other kinds of reductions, uh, how you do, for example, also multiple element reductions at the same time, etc. Okay. But let's get started with views. So, uh, or is there questions for any of us? Damien? No, keep going. Okay. okay, so we're gonna start with views. We're gonna try and learn here, you know, why we introduced the view abstraction, what it's for. We'll talk about the key concepts of views. Uh, we'll talk about, about, you know, what the template parameters are of views. And we'll talk about the view life cycle. Okay, so let's say we have this simple, problem here, right? We want to run a vector ad and you want to run it on the GPU. And you start with a code, you know, which may be allocated, you know, X and Y, Y are new, and then run this Perl 4 loop. Great. So far, you know, uh, that looks fine. Uh, we can also do that with a functor, you know, where you make the X, Y, and A a member of a class, but, uh, you know, you externally uh, allocated the, uh, the pointers via new so there's a problem here, and the problem is that X and Y reside in CPU memory. I showed you that in the little exercise, you know, when I ran without the data management done, I get this illegal memory access. So what we need here is we need a way of storing data, multidimensional arrays, uh, you know, which can actually be accessed by the accelerator. We need things, you know, which allow you to move data back and forth. Uh, 
we need ways to reason about where data lives. And that's what views are. So the view abstraction is largely a lightweight or reasonably lightweight C++ class. It basically contains a pointer to some data and it contains uh, some metadata. For example, you know, it will store stuff like, uh, how long is your array? This view abstraction is templated on the data type. And it's also templated on other things we're going to introduce during the course of this uh, lecture uh, later. Okay, a high level example of how you do, how you use views, right, is you allocate a view, you know, you say like view double star, maybe some other stuff, you know, x, y, and we'll talk about what goes into the constructors in a bit. Then you populate these views, you know, and you use them inside of uh, uh, a Cocos call. One important thing here is views are like pointers. So you can copy them into your functors. You can capture them by value. And that's in particular important uh, because as we discussed before, uh, we need by value capture here. And that means things like, uh, things which have value semantics like std vector wouldn't give you what you expect, right? First of all, because we treat the Lambda as const, you know, you couldn't modify them, you couldn't assign to them. And even if you were, we were to allow you to assign to them because you got a copy in here, you know, you actually assign to different memory than what is outside here if it were value semantics. So views are not like that, views are like pointers. Generally, views are multidimensional arrays. They can have zero to actually eight dimensions right now. So you can actually express a simple scalar, uh, uh, rank zero, that's what we call that uh, view. You can have vectors, matrices, tensors, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, the number of dimension, what we call a rank, is fixed at compile time. So you cannot convert, you know, uh, without going to raw pointers in, you know, as an intermediate step, you cannot convert like a matrix into uh, a vector. The arrays are rectangular. What that means is uh, if you think, for example, of a 2D object, uh, you know, that uh, every row has the same length, right? And every column has the same length. That's what we mean with rectangular. The sizes of these dimensions can be set in compile time or runtime. So you can have both like compile time extents and runtime extents. And you access the elements via the parentheses operator, which should be familiar to everybody, uh, you know, coming from Fortran. Here's a couple of examples. So you start with this, uh, all of these are 3D views. The first one is a 3D view with three runtime dimensions. These runtime dimensions are denoted by the stars here. So double star, star, star means uh, there's three runtime dimensions. It doesn't mean that there is an, uh, some kind of data structure underneath which, which is a pointer of pointers of pointers. All these views we allocate are single allocations underneath, okay? This is just the mechanism to denote the rank of the thing. It doesn't actually tell you anything about what we do under the hoods in terms of allocating data. So when you give that obviously that object a name, you give it a label. These labels are again used, you know, for things like debugging and profiling purposes. For example, uh, when you run a memory profiler as a, one of our memory profilers over this thing, it could tell you, you know, at this call, oh, you allocated an array. It was called label and it allocated this much memory in uh, you know this location. Because it has three runtime dimensions, you have to give it three runtime numbers for the you know the three to runtime lengths, and that then will allocate a view. The other ones here, the next one has two runtime dimensions and one compile time dimension. Because it only has two runtime dimensions, you only give it two arguments. The last one has only compile time dimensions. So the only argument you give to the constructor is the label. Uh, the benefit of compile time dimensions is that compile time dimensions allow 
our internal indexing to be better optimized, right? So if you were, for example, to index into a view even with like literal numbers, you know, you were accessing a, you know, three comma two, and your uh, dimensions are all compile time, then the compiler can actually at compile time compute the offset to the uh, to the pointer and thus eliminate a lot of integer arithmetic in your code. You access that then, like in Fortran, you know, parenthesis operator i comma j comma k, and you can access to them, you can implement them, you can read them. It just returns a reference to the object, right, as a, to the underlying element. One important thing about runtime versus compile time dimensions here is runtime size dimensions must come first. The main reason in this case is that uh, unfortunately double star and two star is not a valid type in C++, so you're not allowed to actually type that in your code. Uh, in what we introduced with MDSpan for the C++ standard, we changed this a little bit where, you know, you give the, you give the uh, scalar type and the dimensionality independently in two different objects. And that actually allows you to mix and match uh, runtime and compile time dimensions more freely. And we're gonna expose that in Cocos in the future uh, version. Okay. Now, we'll need to talk a bit about the view life cycle. So first of all, these allocations only happen when, uh, you know, in some sense explicitly specified. They only really happen when you call a constructor on a view which takes a label. There are other constructors like copy constructors and there's also like constructors which allow you to hand us a raw pointer. In those cases, you do not get allocations, okay? The copy constructions and assignments are shallow, like pointers, right? So you really should pass views by value, not by reference for the most part. And what that means is that, you know, if you do the shallow assignment, right, and you do, or you copy construct the view, we're gonna reference the same object. Because of that, by default, our views are doing reference counting. And that means uh, the views go out of scope you know, when we go out of scope, we do a deallocation. That is actually the reason why we introduced the braces in the exercise, because all the views need to be deallocated because before you call Cocos finalize. Uh, if you wait until, Co you know, if you call Cocos finalize with still views around, the Cocos runtime might uh, complain about things like, uh, you know, leak memory. Largely because of that reference counting and the fact that they are shallow, you know, the construction, copy construction and assignment, et cetera, uh, views largely behave like shared pointers. Okay. Here's an example. So we allocate two views here, view double star five, you know, it's a two dimensional view with one runtime and uh, one compile time dimension. We create one view called A, one call, view called B with different lengths. We assign them to each other, we do a copy construction and we assign to the elements. And then we print the value of A. And the question is what gets printed? So there's two possibilities here really, right? One, two, three. Uh, and the answer is, you know, if you think about this being shared pointers, the answer is three. How does that come to pass? So in this first line, we start allocating something, right? We actually, after this first line, have two allocations. We have one allocation for A, one allocation for B, one is N -lang long and one is K long, okay? Now on the next line, A equals B, we assign B to A, which means that the reference count of the original allocation of A goes to zero and it will be deallocated. At this point, after this line, we only have one allocation around of length k. And both a and b reference the same thing. If you were to ask a after this line what its label is, right, the answer is b, 
because the label is associated with the allocation. Now we copy construct B into C. One thing you see here is you can actually convert, you know, between runtime and compile time dimensions. Uh, and now C also points to the allocation B initially did. So C also is gonna have a length of K. And if you ask for its label, it's gonna tell you that its label is B. That means after this line, A, B, and C all point to the same allocation, which means that A02, B02, and C02 are the same element. And that means you just overwrite, you know, you first write a one in, then you write a two in, and then you write a three in. That means it's gonna print three. Okay. Obviously, you may need to ask the view a couple of its properties. The most important one of those is, uh, you know, what its sizes are. And you do that via the extent function. You give that extent function uh, dimension, you know, which one you actually want to query, and uh, then it returns a number. There's also a function called static extent and that one can give you a compile time answer for compile time dimensions, which means that you can actually use static extent, for example, inside of, uh, as part of template arguments, for example. You can get the raw pointer out of a view via its data function. That will just essentially give you the pointer to the first element of the view. And you can access its label via the label function, if you are so inclined. Okay. We have an exercise for this uh, uh, submodule. In this exercise, basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna take, so it's, the same, it's the same problem again. It's essentially starting where, uh, exercise one stopped. And what you do there is you're gonna, uh, uh, you're gonna replace the raw pointers, you know, X, Y, and Z with Cocos views. So uh, X and Y will be replaced with a one-dimensional view and A will be replaced with a two-dimensional view. And uh, you can then run and compile that thing for both GPUs and CPUs and it will run and it will give you, you know, some performance numbers. So one thing you should try then is you should try and run this problem, you know, with like different problem sizes. You should run it with, you know, different number of rows to get a little bit of feeling, you know, what's going on there. Uh, also change the number of repeats as a half of it does the y, y times AX. And then compare the performance of, you know, CPU versus GPU. Note in exercise two, uh, only the actual y times ax uh, kernel has a parallel reduce in it. The initialization calls are done via serial loops, and they are supposed to be done via serial loops. So, so leave them, leave them that way. Uh, and this thing is using something called UVM. We're going to introduce that in a second. You know what that actually is when you compile it for the GPU. Largely, that means that an allocation done with UVM is uh, accessible both by the host and the GPU, but it comes with some caveats. Okay, so we introduced basic views now. We talked a little bit, you know, about uh, what they are. And, uh, but we didn't talk a lot about, you know, a number of things in there. We didn't talk about memory spaces yet. Uh, you know, how to control where the data is actually allocated. We'll cover it next. We didn't talk about data copying back and forth, etc. That's one of the reasons why the second exercise is using unified memory instead of doing explicit data management. We didn't talk about layouts yet. Uh, that said, if you run that second exercise, you will see that it already performs better than uh, what on the GPU, than what we did with, uh, uh, with this first extra exercise. Uh, we're going to talk about these layouts a bit later today. Uh, memory traits and subview, you know, how you slice and dice with stuff, uh, that's something uh, for another lecture. Okay, with that, we come to execution and memory spaces.
So what do we want to learn in this submodule? We want to learn about heterogeneous nodes and how we reason about heterogeneous nodes and its hardware resources inside of Cocos via the space abstraction. We want to learn how to control where you execute code uh, using execution spaces. We want to control how we explicitly manage where data uh, is allocated via memory spaces. And we'll learn about you know, how to avoid this problem we had earlier uh, you know, with illegal memory access and how we manage data movement. This will also introduce a bit the need for, for you know, initializing Cocos and finalize. And we'll talk about the annotation macros for portability. So this mysterious Cocos Lambda I showed you earlier. So let's start with execution spaces. So in the Cocos lingo, execution spaces are what we call a homogeneous set of execution resources and the mechanism you use to execute on that. You know, think of it as a place and a mechanism or a way to run code, right? A low level place and way to run code. Uh, so if you have this architecture we talked about earlier, you know, where you have this, this CPU uh, thing and then some accelerators attached to it, uh, you know, an execution space would be, for example, the CPU cores, you know, on the CPU. Another execution space would be, you know, representing the, uh, the accelerator. And those things all sit on top of low level execution mechanisms. So for example, the CPU cores can be in Cocos targeted with different execution spaces. For example, with a serial execution space, which would only give you access to a single core, with a pthread spec and with a OpenMP execution space, with also an HBX execution space and stuff like that. All of those would run on the course, right, on the CPU course. To target accelerators, uh, we currently support CUDA and HIP and OpenMP target. With uh, OpenMP target, the uh, least along, so there's still some capabilities missing, but HIP is getting pretty close to having, you know, all the, all the things uh, you, you know, you usually would use. So if you now look at code, right, there is largely two different things. There is the code which you, uh, which you run inside of uh, Cocos parallel constructs, you know, in these loop bodies, and that's parallel code. And there's all the rest of the code outside of parallel constructs. And that is what we generally refer to as host code, okay? That's where you do things like, you know, MPI calls, uh, interacting, you know, doing IO and stuff like that. So where will this code be run? The host code, everything outside of parallel constructs, of Cocos parallel constructs, is run by the host process, okay? That is run, but you know, if you don't do anything weird and fancy, like running, you know, mixing Cocos with Legion or something like that, uh, it is run by the thread which starts running main. The parallel code is run by one of Cocos's execution spaces because there wasn't an execution space explicitly defined here anywhere. In this case, it's run by the default execution space. So if you want to run it somewhere differently than what you, where it's running right now, there's two ways to doing it. One thing is you can, def con uh, you can control what the default execution space is. If you remember what I did in the exercise, I changed the devices from OpenMP to CUDA, and that changed the default execution space from OpenMP to CUDA. So that, can, that is one way of controlling it. The other way how to control it is to specify the execution space in the policy. Now, right now, the policy is a kind of simple, right? It's just an integer. And obviously, a simple integer doesn't have a place you know, to put an execution policy. But the thing here is that this integer is essentially just a shortcut. It's a shortcut for what we call a range policy. So what is a range policy? 
A range policy is a policy which says, I'm just parallelizing over a 1D range of integers. It takes a begin and an end value, right? and it can take template arguments. And one of the template arguments it can take is an execution space. What you will note here is that execution spaces, as of where you execute some Perl 4, is a compile time decision. There's no way in Cocos to make a runtime decision for that. You can obviously use you know, the typical ways of how you convert like runtime decisions into compile time decisions, but you have to do that explicitly on your side. We do not give you a shortcut for that. The main reason for that is that, uh, you know, if you want the runtime decision, it just means you have to compile everything for everything, right? And that is blowing up your executables and your compile time. Now, what this number of intervals was is, it was essentially just a shortcut for a range policy going from zero to the number with no template argument. So everything being defaulted. So in order to use an, a particular execution space as an argument there, a couple of things must be true. First, you need to com compile Cocos with that execution space enabled. So if you want to have, you know, use OpenMP in one loop and CUDA in another, you know, you have to enable both OpenMP and CUDA, which you can do. The execution spaces must be initialized. Why is that so? Because internally we may use uh, some resources. For example, parallel reductions use internally some scratch arrays uh, where we store intermediate uh, results. And that stuff must be initialized you know, before you call this. Uh, you know, things like thread pools must be set up and, and other stuff like that. So you need to call initialize. And if you call initialize, you know, you should also call finalize at the end. One thing about initialize and finalize, like MPI initialize and finalize, you cannot initialize finalize multiple times, right? You can't call Cocos initialize, then Cocos finalize, and then call Cocos initialize again. You can call Cocos initialize multiple times because it will ignore the subsequent calls, uh, but you can't finalize and then call Cocos initialize again. Where is one more thing you need to do? And that is where this Cocos Lambda comes in. I showed in this exercise, in this extra exercise. Functions must be marked with a macro in order to execute them inside of non-CPU spaces. The same is true for Lambdas. Why is that? If you think about CUDA, right, they have this markup called device host, right? And what that tells the compiler is this function should be compiled for both the GPU and the CPU. The compiler needs that because otherwise it would need to essentially uh, kind of try to compile everything for everything. And if it hits some kind of instruction or call, it can't do, you know, essentially throw the function away. The problem with that kind of design decision would be that it's really hard to distinguish between uh, you didn't actually want to compile this function for the GPU and you made a mistake by calling, say, uh, CPU, uh, you know, vector intrinsic or something like that, you know, without guarding it. So functions must be marked and that tells the compiler, I want to compile this function for, uh, you know, the GPU and the, and the host. The Cocos inline function macro includes that. It includes also the inline. Uh, you can also use the Cocos function macro, which omits the inline and only has the other stuff. Uh, this is because, you know, uh, we do that macro because obviously device host isn't a valid thing if you just compile for OpenMP. So we essentially hide the markup, which might be backend specific in there. Generally, every function you call inside of a parallel loop must be marked with Cocos function or Cocos inline function. There's no exceptions to that, really. I mean, 
They are, but they really don't work well. Um, basic rule, just mark everything which is getting called inside of a parallel loop as Cocos function or Cocos inline function. In particular for complex codes, that in the beginning is a little bit annoying because you call all these little helper classes and now, you know, just to parallelize that one loop, you know, you need to go into all these helper classes, potentially, you know, helper classes from other people uh, and mark up all the functions. But uh, that is somewhat of a necessary evil right now. The same is true for lambdas. So when you want to dispatch a lambda to the uh, GPU, you need to mark it up, you know, in CUDA and HIP, for example, with this device host stuff. And that's what Cocos Lambda includes. Okay. Now we talk, that was about execution spaces. But that's only half a story, right? We have a problem we still had, you know, after we fixed the the Cocos Lambda and we actually executed on the GPU with our exercise one, this, this extra exercise was uh, that we segfaulted. We got an illegal memory access and that was because we didn't do data management yet, correct? And let's say you already started with views, right? And you made a view, you know, blah, 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 data, data size. And then, you know, first, initialize it by reading stuff from, from a file. And because it's not inside of a Cocos Perl region, this is running in the host process. And then you start, you know, uh, sum up all the values you read from that file. And you do that in, you know, some execution space. Great, we can do it. But there's a question. Where is the data actually stored of that view? Is it in GPU memory? Is it in CPU memory? Is it in both? You don't really see, right? We didn't specify anything up here. And what does that mean for, is this legal? You know, can you access that in the host, in the host process? Can you access it in GPU memory, uh, in, which, in GPU execution? That's the question we need to answer. And the answer to that are memory spaces. So what are memory spaces? Analog to the execution spaces, memory spaces are uh, essentially explicitly manageable memory resources. Think of them, pretty equivalent to, you know, like uh, allocator types. So in our, you know, hypothetical node, we have, you know, multiple places where we can store data. We have on-package memory on the CPU, we have on-package memory on the accelerators, we have DRAM memory, and maybe, you know, some capacity non-volatile memory. All of these things are memory resources and we would all be exposed inside of Cocos via memory spaces. The important thing here is that every view stores its data in a memory space, which is set at compile time. Okay. Every view has a memory space associated with it. You can explicitly specify that memory space. You hand it as an additional template argument to the view. And there's many of those, right? There's things like host space, CUDA space, CUDA UVM space, etc. Uh, the reason that these are pretty explicit is that all these different allocation mechanisms in the backends come with different semantics. For example, CUDA UVM space behaves very differently from CUDA space. And HIP, for the matter, doesn't actually have an equivalent to CUDA UVM space at this point. Right? So uh, this is something, you know, where why this is very explicit. In a real code, what you would do is you would essentially use type depths, you know, depending on what you compile for to decide what memory spaces to use. And in simple cases, you, do, you actually don't need all of this and we'll show you that a little bit later. Now, each execution space also has a default memory space associated with it. It's the memory space, you know, which the execution space can access the best. And if you were, as what that allows us to do is, you can actually create a view and instead of giving it a memory space, you can give it any space. You can give it an execution space or a memory space. And that will work. 
if you do not provide any space argument, okay, what we are doing is we allocate your memory over memory space associated with that view. Is the default memory space of the default execution space. The reason that we do that is it essentially means that if you allocate views and you only ever access these views inside of parallel constructs and you just use integers, you know, to execute them, you don't, you don't mess around with execution spaces explicitly, right? You can actually write a code which does not mess around with execution or memory spaces at all and it will just work, okay? What that last point means is that view double star is equivalent to view double star default execution space colon colon memory space. Okay. This Cocos colon colon default execution space is an actual type that which exists in Cocos. So you can actually use that. Okay, let's talk about this a little bit more. When we have, for example, a view inside of host space. What happens here is that you actually have two things. You have the view object itself, right? And as we said, the view object itself is like a pointer, you know? It actually is a struct which contains, for example, the, uh, the pointer to the actual data. It contains extents and it contains a reference counting mechanism, right? This is what we call the metadata. And the pointer inside of that metadata points to the actual allocation underneath the data, okay? When you allocate the view inside your host process, right? What happens is that it gets the metadata potentially on the stack, and then it allocates data on the heap, right? Which, and the metadata points to that data. But both of them are on the host. When you allocate a view the CUDA space, right? The metadata is still created in the stack of that host process, right? Because view is just the struct in the host process right now. What happens though is that the data it points to is allocated in GPU memory. Because the metadata exists now just as a struct in the host, right? You can on the host ask it, what is my extent? What is my label? What is my data uh, pointer, right? Things like that. What you cannot do is you cannot access an element in the host process. So if we look at, you know, actually executing code, right? In combination with allocating data, how does that work? You usually first declare your views, you allocate data, then you instantiate a functor, with you know, these views as members or you create a lambda. And then you call a parallel something which, uh, which gets the lambda or the, or the functor as an argument, okay? What now happens internally is that the functor or the lambda is getting copied to the device. Because before that, right, it's actually just a struct in the host process. So we need to copy it to the device, to the GPU, in order to execute it on the GPU. Then the kernel is run, and then the copy of the functor on the device is released. What doesn't happen here is, there is no inspection phase of, you know, what is the, what is the views you captured, you know, and there's nothing happening in the sense of, oh, you captured a host view, I need to create a device view and now copy the data over or something like that, right? There's no automatic deep copy or uh, of array data happening here. These views are just captured like pointers and made a member of that functor of a, of a lambda and thus the metadata is copied over then to the device. So we'll see that here, right? We create that view and before we launch the kernel, right, you have the metadata on the host and it points to some data on the device. But when we launch a kernel, that metadata, that struct is copied as part of the Lambda to the device. And that means now the GPU can access that, can ask it, you know, what are my extents? And it, can, it now knows for pointer, you know, it can access the pointer which points to the 
actual data, which means you now can dereference that data on the, on the device. A little bit more contrived example, right? If you were to access, you know, have two views, one in device and one in host space, right? You have metadata for both of them. One of them points to the host, one of them points to the device. And then you can capture both of them in this, in, in this Lambda. And what then happens is both of them get copied over. You can actually now ask on the GPU, my host view, you know, what is your extent? Because the extent is part of the metadata, so it can actually access that. You can ask it, you know, what is my pointer? What you cannot do is you cannot dereference an element. This line, this host i equals something will fail because it's trying to dereference data, a pointer, which points to memory in the host. Okay. Okay, let's come back to that summing the array thing. So we allocate a view and we say, oh, you know what? I'm gonna try and ex execute the summation in, in the CUDA execution space, so let me allocate it in CUDA memory space. Great. The problem is that fails because this access where I'm filling this array from, uh, from a file fails. Okay, I can do it with host space, right? Now this one works, but the kernel will get the illegal access because the GPU cannot access the host space. So how do we resolve, resolve that problem? There's a couple of potential answers to that. One of them is using CUDA UVM space. That was what implicitly was being done in the, uh, in the make file for the exercise too. There's also CUDA host pin space, we'll skip that. Uh, and there's mirroring. And mirroring is, you know, the main kind of performance maybe we're going to talk about. But let's look at UVM space first. So CUDA UVM space is a special allocation mechanism provided by CUDA, which gives you allocations which are accessible from both the CPU and the GPU. Depending on your platform and the hardware generation, it either allocates two complete arrays, you know, one in CPU and G one in GPU memory space, it happens, for example, on Windows. It happens on, uh, on like Kepler and earlier hardware potentially. Uh, or on newer hardware on Linux, like, you know, like with Volta GPUs, uh, what it will do is it will actually just allocate one allocation, but the pages can be migrated by the, either the hardware or the software underneath, you know, by the CUDA runtime. Um, somebody needs to be muted here. Okay, so what now happens is when you allocate this view, right, this UVM space, you still have your metadata, but it essentially has as if it has like, you know, points to both of these things, right? And what that means is you can access the stuff you know, from either the GPU or the CPU. You can dereference it from both sides. And that means this fill it from a file and then run it on the GPU works. The problem with that is that it potentially comes with some performance hit. Interestingly enough, the performance hit is generally higher on, uh, on the machines uh, where it does has, has, has page migration. Uh, the reason for that is, say you started filling this thing on the CPU, right? Which means that all your pages are on the CPU. And now you run the kernel and the thread tries to access something. What happens is that it gets a page fold. It says, oh, this page isn't on the GPU. You know, runtime or hardware, move this page over. The problem is the latency of that page fold is so high that your first time you go through this kernel, you access this array with something like four gigabytes a second, even on, on a machine like Summit, where the actual bandwidth between GPU and CPU should be closer to 100 gigabytes a second. So the latency of a page fold is the problem. If you 
only ever do that once, right? And afterwards, you know, you run a thousand kernels on the GPU accessing the data, right? Without ever accessing it on the host again. You know, okay, the first call is gonna be slow, but after that, it's fine. But if you go back and forth, right? That is actually pretty bad. And it's actually way slower than doing explicit memory copies. Okay, so let's talk about the explicit memory copies. And here's a concept, concept for that, and that's mirroring. The actual reason for mirroring is something we're gonna, you know, talk a bit later. Why not just allocate a host space and a CUDA space thing? Uh, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So mirrors are views of equivalent arrays residing in possibly different memory spaces. Okay, so essentially it's you know, two arrays, two views, and they are bitwise copyable, the underlying data. That's the idea of mirrors. So how does that work? You allocate some view, and then you call Cocos create mirror view, and you get a host view of that thing, okay? By default, create mirror view creates a host version of that thing. Uh, Often what you would do is you, you would just like use auto here, you know, instead of trying to figure out what the actual type is. Now what you have is you have now one view which points to say the GPU memory and another view which points to the uh, CPU memory. And you copy back and forth between these guys via deep copy. So let's look at the pattern in a bit more detail. So you start by creating a view in some memory space, you know, whatever its space is. Then you create a host view. You know, the reason that we go this way around or why we, you know, why the primary interface we designed, you know, was kind of this way around is that in Cocos, we generally have a device centric view. You know, everything kind of executes on the device and just sometimes you need versions on the host in order to do things like IO, okay? And that's where this is coming from. Okay, so we now created a host view of that thing. What you then do is you populate that host view, you know, say from a file or whatever. Uh, you then deep copy it. So Cocos deep copy works like uh, mem copy, you know, destination comma source. Then you launch the kernel, you know, you use and change view or you know, run multiple kernels. And if you need the data back, you know, you copy it back. Great. So, one of the problems with that is you might think is, you know, oh, what happens if I just compile for the CPU? Does it now mean that it creates more memory, allocates more memory, which I don't need? And does it mean it does all the deep copies all the time? You know, even though it was actually just the thing I did, you know, in order to deal with the GPUs with the separate memory spaces? And the answer is no. What create mirror view does is it only allocates new data if the host process cannot access views data, okay? Otherwise, what it actually does is it essentially just does a copy construction. So you end up with two views referencing the same data. And if that happens, right, then a deep copy between these two guys will just discover, oh, you know what, you copy two views and they actually are the same view, right? They just point to the same data, they have the same length. So this is a no-op, I'm just gonna return, okay? And that means both your allocation goes away. It's essentially a no-op. It's just a copy construction of a pointer effectively. Uh, and your deep copies go away. It will just be a comparison of some pointers and some links, and then it will come back. If you truly need a, deep, a copy for algorithmic reason, you can reuse create mirror instead of create mirror view. That will always allocate data, okay? Um, okay, with that, there is an exercise free. So what that exercise does is it, uh, it essentially tells you to replace the, you know, to actually add these host mirror views and use deep copy to uh, copy data back and forth. What that does is it, it eliminates the need for this UVM. So what happened in that exercise too is that we told, that we gave Cocos an option which changed the default memory space of the CUDA execution space. It essentially changed, normally it's CUDA space, 
And that CUDA space is only accessible from CUDA. It's not accessible from the host. But there is an option in Cocos which says, make the default memory space of like the CUDA execution space UVM, right? Uh, that essentially helps you to write your code, you know, without like deep copies and stuff like that and without actually referencing memory spaces at all. But it really just changed that one type def, right? In either case, both CUDA space and CUDA UVM space as memory space are still available explicitly. Uh, but if you now use host mirrors here, you can get rid of that need of using UVM. And what you can see with that then is in particular, if you compare to exercise two and you change the number of repeats, in particular try like just one repeat, you will see that the performance numbers look very differently. Okay. Uh, one more thing. I said UVM memory is accessible from both GPU and CPU. That means creating a host mirror view of a UVM memory is still giving you just a copy construction of a new view because the UVM memory is already accessible from, from the CPU. So it doesn't create a new copy. Okay. So what did we learn in this section? We learned about how data is stored in views. We learned that they are like pointers to multidimensional arrays residing memory spaces. We learned about how they abstract away, you know, platform dependent allocation. You don't need to know that CUDA space is allocated with CUDA malloc and, uh, you know, CUDA UVM space is allocated with CUDA managed malloc or something like that. Uh, we learned about heterogeneous nodes and that we have one or more memory spaces. We learned about mirroring, you know, to get uh, the performance access of views. And we learned about uh, heterogeneous node having multiple execution spaces and you can control where to execute code either by a template parameter to an execution policy or by compile time selection of the default execution space. Okay, with that we come to managing memory access patterns. So we said last week, right, that data access patterns are a real problem. And we're gonna learn here why and how we solve that. Uh, we will talk about how these memory access patterns result from how Cocos Maps Perl work to execution resources and the combining it with layouts of a multidimensional arrays. Uh, we'll learn about how it's so important. We'll learn about caching and coalescing and we'll see some concrete examples for what happens with that. Let's think back about our exercise, this y times ax. What happens here is we paralyzed over the rows. So every execution resource, every core, every thread, right, will essentially run its own little dot product over its own row. Okay. Now the question is, how should a be stored in memory in order to get good performance? Right. What should you do there? And, you know, if you come from, if you have a bit experience of linear algebra, there's two kind of main possibilities which come to mind. We are called in linear algebra column major and row major. What that means is column major means that columns are stored consecutive in memory, right? If you increase the column index of a matrix by one, you go in memory forward by one element. Right? While if you go by rows, you stride. You know, the access, the, the jump in memory is essentially the length of a column. With a row major storage, the rows are stored consecutive and you jump when you go down a, a column. Okay. And while this works for 2D with column major and row major and makes sense, right? We had to come up with some other names because uh, we also want 3D arrays and 4D arrays and 6D arrays and stuff like that. And what we came up with is layout left and layout right. Layout left essentially says, you know, that my leftmost index as a column index is the one which is, you know, consecutive in memory or has the slowest, uh, the smallest stride. Layout right says that my rightmost index is the stride one index, okay? 
The point here is that every view has a multidimensional array layout and it is determined at compile time. Okay, this is a compile time decision. The most common layouts are layout left and layout right. If you specify them, they go before any space argument, but you can also only provide the layout and no space argument. The same way as we saw before, you can actually provide just the space argument and not the layout argument. But if you provide both, the layout comes before the space. So I said the most common are layout left and layout right. Layout left, as I already said, is the leftmost index is stride one. And then if you go you know, from dimension to dimension, the stride increases uh, you know, the further right you go. Uh, layout right is the other way around. So the rightmost is the stride one and the leftmost index is the, has, has the highest stride. If no layout is specified, the default layout for the memory space of that view is used. Okay. Uh, and actually, it's kind of coming from the execution space associated with that memory space. So the layout left for would be for CUDA space and layout right for host space, and we'll come to why that is in a bit. You can, in theory, write your own layouts. You're probably going to need our help, even though it's you know not necessarily too much code. In particular, if you write something special like your special 3D layout, uh, you know it's it's not too much code to write but it's a bit funky how that works in Cocos right now. Uh, it will be easier when we replace our current underlying implementation with MDSpan uh, because we learned from our design mistakes and fixed them in what we proposed for the C++ standard. We have a couple of advanced layouts directly provided by Cocos, things like uh, you know, layout stride, which has arbitrary strides, uh, or layout tiled. So associated with this thing is again an exercise. What you do in that exercise, and we'll talk about the results in a second because it's important for the rest of the lecture. Uh, but what you do in this exercise is you uh, explicitly use memory spaces and execution spaces and layouts for uh, A, X, and Y, okay? And what you are supposed to do here is what I really recommend you doing there is playing around with these combinations. You know, see what happens if you allocate your stuff in host space, but you execute in CUDA space, right? What happens if you uh, change the layouts explicitly, right? What kind of performance do you get? What kind of errors do you get? You know, things like that. So uh, try that out, okay? Let's say you did this exercise and you did combinations which actually work. So we run on the GPU, we run on the CPU, and uh, we compare the layouts, okay? What you will find is if you actually scan like for a fixed size problem, I think this was like S27 or so, and you change the number of rows, what you find is these kind of curves in performance. This was done on uh, dual socket Haswell on a, Knight's Landing, uh, you know, product, and on a P100, a Pascal generation GPU. And what you see here for this exercise is that you get about, you know, close to 600 gigabytes or, you know, 560 or something like that on the GPU if you use layout left. If you lose layout right, you only get like 160 or so. On a KNL, you get in the high bandwidth memory, a bit over 300 when you use layout right. But if you, if you use layout left, it drops you know, all the way down to, in some cases, like 10 gigabytes a second or something like that. The same on Haswell. If you use layout right, you get good performance. You get the 100, you know, 20 ish gigabytes a second you get from this kind of Haswell dual socket system. And if you use layout left, you get 10. So what we see here is you want layout left on the GPU, but layout right on the CPU. And this also explains why we got uh, the bad performance, you know, the 160 or so gigabytes a second we saw on the Volta earlier when in this exercise one where we didn't use views, but we just used properly allocated memory. Uh, what happened there is that in our original code, the layout was hard coded to effectively layout right, right? So we got the good performance on the CPU, 
but we didn't really good, get good performance on the GPU. The question is why? And the answer to that question uh, has something to do with what we call threat independence. So think about this loop, right? I'm just running a, a 1D loop and I'm accessing elements, you know, one by one. Now, after a thread, red D, you know, can it continue to execute immediately? On CPUs, yeah, because all the threads are independent. They can execute at any rate, right? As long as you don't write an explicit barrier somehow, you know, and it's actually pretty complicated code to write an explicit barrier. Uh, you know, the CPU thread will just continue executing. It doesn't know anything about the other threads. The only way for a CPU thread to communicate with another thread is through memory, right? Where it doesn't know anything about how these other guys are executing. That is not true on GPUs. On GPUs, a certain grouping of threads actually execute synchronized. The instructions on GPUs are more like vector instructions, right? Where multiple things are done at the same time. And these groups, they have to execute the same instruction at the same time. You can mask out threads, you know, which didn't execute that instruction because they didn't pass through a conditional or something like that, right? But we have to execute synchronize, right? In particular, in this case, it means that before any thread on the GPU can go on to compute, you know, that value to update plus equal or go to the next iteration or something like that, right? Every thread in its group, which is a warp or wavefront, depending on whether you're on, on CUDA or HIP, you know, must finish their loads before any of these threads in that group can move on. The interesting question is here, how many cache lines does that now mean must be fetched before the threads can move on? And in order to get that optimized, right, what we want is we want kind of access patterns like that, if you think about it. On CPUs, we have a few independent cores, you know, they all have their separate caches, right? What that means is that every thread kind of wants to work on its own little piece of memory, right? The stuff which is in, in its cache. That means that you want thread zero, you know, to first read element zero, then element one, and so on. Thread one should start reading somewhere else so that it doesn't try to steal the same cache line, you know, from, from the cache or something like that. So you start reading somewhere completely else in the array and start reading, you know, first an element and then the next element and so on. And the same for the other threads. On GPUs, that's not true. Because if these guys are synchronized, right, and have to wait until everyone read their stuff in, you know, every thread in that, in that group read that stuff, their stuff, what you want is that we all hit the same cache line so that the core only has to run, read one cache line. So how you try to organize your memory access is that if thread zero reads the first element, thread one reads the second, thread two the third, you know, thread three uh, the fourth element. And then they go to the next cache line. And again, read it that way. And what that is called is, on the CPU what we did is we want caching, right? Thread, a thread reads an element, and because the core lo loaded the whole cache line in, you want its next read to hit the same cache line, be the next element on that cache line, okay? While on GPUs, you want coalescing. You want all the threads in the group to hit the same cache line. What that means a bit more specific is that if red T currently accesses a position I, in order to get caching, you want its next read to be i plus one. For coalescing, what you want is if red t is reading position i, you want red t plus one to access i plus one. Okay. 
If you do not access memory core list on a GPU or uncached on CPUs, your performance will tank. And you know, often by orders, uh, an order of magnitude. So that actually poses a little bit of a problem. If we think about this array summation experience, right? Is this actually cached for OpenMP and coalesced for CUDA? Now, in this case, the data mapping, the data is actually pretty, layout is pretty easy, right? It's a 1D array, there isn't any big choice. So how does that come to peace, right? Uh, essentially, what matters here is how threads are given iterations, right? So if you have P threads, right, which indices do we want thread zero to handle? There's two options here. One is contiguous and one is thread. So in contiguous mode, what you do is you give thread zero the first P, uh, the first N over P elements, and then thread one, the next N over P elements, and so on. What that means is that each thread will go through consecutive indices and thus through consecutive memory. The other option is strided. So you give the first thread, you know, uh, element zero, and then you give it n over p, and then two times n over p, and so on. That means thread one will get, you know, one, n over p plus one, etc. So consecutive indices are given to consecutive threads. And that means you want the contiguous stuff for CPU and the strided assignment to GPUs, right? Let's look at that again. We iterate over this execution with, with an execution space, you know, over our loop indices. And if we do this that way, right, where we have contiguous accesses for CPU and strided for GPUs, what happens is that you also get cached accesses on the data for the CPU and coalesced accesses for the GPU. And that is what by default we do, right? We give contiguous chunks out to CPUs and, uh, you know, stride it for CUDA. Now, we don't technically really guarantee any of that, right? But there is something of a rule of thumb, which is, you know, uh, the easiest way to remember this. Basically, what you should do, if you just parallelize, you know, you one loop, you do just simple parallelization, right? Outermost loop. What then should happen is, if you do not mess with the layouts, you should have your parallel index, you know, your iteration index, correspond to the first index in your array. And then by, by def default, everything maps up. So how do we achieve now in total, you know, the performance memory access? We get that by mapping parallel work indices and multidimensional array layouts appropriately for the architecture. And what's, that's what you saw in our example, right? If we have row major storage in our example, and you remember we parallelized over the row index, right? As the, the, or the column in the, no, the we parallelize over the number of, uh, number of rows, right? Uh, then every thread was handling one row. So if we do row major layout right, we get caching because every thread goes consecutively through its row. And that's good for the CPU, but bad for the GPU. If we do layout left, what we get is we get coalescing, which is good for the GPU, but bad for the CPU. Now what happens by default is that we choose layout left here for CUDA and layout right for uh, the CPU. And because we mapped this all up, right, we, we didn't specify anything here and we parallelized over the leftmost index, you know, you get the correct behavior both on OpenMP and on CUDA. And that gets you best picture. You get coalesced access on the GPU by default and cached access on the CPU.
Okay. With that, we come to the memory access pattern summary. So every view has this layout set at compile time through a template parameter. You have layout right and layout left as the most common. Views in host space default to layout right and views in CUDA space default to layout left. These layouts are extensible. You can actually write your own ones if you want and you can actually do any kind of mapping calculation you want. But in order to achieve performance, what this all needs to end up with is that you get caching on a CPU and coalescing on a GPU. We map work indices and multidimensional layouts such that you know, the combination works. And there isn't really anything in OpenMP, OpenACC, or OpenCL, or whatever to do this, uh, to do this kind of stuff. You know? We don't have construct like that in the language which, or in the programming model which allow you to solve that issue, right? Typically, you would hard code your indexing and, you know, that gives you good performance on one architecture but bad performance on another. Okay, one last side comment. I said earlier that I wanted to give you uh, an explanation of why the mirroring and why not just allocate one view in CUDA space and one view in host space, right? And then deep copy between the two. The reason is if you do that for 2D arrays, they would default to different layouts. And if they default to different layouts, you cannot mem copy between these two things. But that's the only mechanism we have available to get data from a host space to a CUDA space. So the deep copy would fail. It would tell you these two guys have incompatible layouts and the only mechanism I can use to deep copy here is uh, essentially a memory copy, a bitwise copy, and that doesn't work, okay? And that's what the mirroring fixes. The host mirror of a CUDA view, right, will also have the same layout. It will also be layout left, which means that your accesses on the host will be not as optimal, you know, generally, as you might hope for. But the idea here is, as I said, that we have a device-centric view and that you only do stuff which is anyway slow and you know, uh, non-performance critical on the, uh, on the CPU. Like if you do IO, right, whether or not you have the correct data access pattern on your view isn't the critical part in your performance for the IO. The critical part is writing to disk or writing to the network or something like that, right? And uh, you know, even with a wrong data access pattern, that will still work. Okay, with that, we come to our last submodule. Unless Damien says there's something I need to address. No, keep going. Okay. So our last common uh, thing here is advanced reductions. So what we want to learn here is. Uh, we want to first learn how to use reducers to perform something different than a summation. We'll talk a little bit about how to do multiple reductions in, in a single kernel. And we'll talk about how you can use Cocos views as a result place in order to get asynchronicity. Okay. So far, the reductions we did had only done a summation. And you didn't even explicitly specify that, right? You just said parallel reduce and your loop body happened to do a plus equal, great. But it didn't actually specify what the threads were doing, you know, how to combine the thread contributions. Uh, and the reason is that we default to a summation because it turns out, you know, that, I don't know, 90% of all reductions are summations, but, you know, the other 10% are not, and we need to have a way to do that. And that's what we call a reducer. So when you use a reducer, what happens is you provide this kind of other thing here as in the place of a result. In this case, we provide this Cocos Max object and it's just wrapping uh, the actual storage space for the result. And what that says is, you know, don't do a summation for the combining the thread results. Do a max operation, a max reduction. 
Now, note how I changed also the value to update as with, with, with local thread local update here to do a max operation. Okay. This operation has to match what you do here with the Cocos Max. Otherwise, you get random results. Okay. This is the same as in OpenMP. In OpenMP, you have to say both, you know, reduction plus colon or whatever, and then actually do that operation in your loop body. The scalar type you use for that operation is again duplicated here as a template argument for the max. We can probably fix that in C17 with like a template argument deduction from constructor arguments. There's quite a few reducers available. Uh, basically, we have everything MPI has plus a couple extra. And you, know, you can just go to that uh, wiki page and see the whole list of all the ones we have available. But you know, there's all the stuff like you know, product, min, max, min, log, max, log, min, max, log, and so on. There's also like bitwise ones and logical ones, etc. Some of these reducers, like min log, for example, use a special scalar type. So min log needs a scalar type which stores both the minimum and the, and the location, right? And so essentially, its scalar type is like a, a, a pair. And what you can do is you can get that value type from the, from the type of a reducer. Okay. And obviously, that value type needs also to be the value type for your uh, reduction argument here in the, in the lambda or functor. In the, in the signature of the operator. Sometimes you also need to do multiple reductions at the same time. This is a new feature in Cocos. It's actually so new that it's only in Cocos develop at this point. It will be in the release 3.2. What it allows you to do is it allows you to provide multiple reducers or result arguments and the mix thereof uh, to the parallel reduce, okay? The functor and lambda takes when matching thread local variables. You see, I did here, what, what this thing does is it does a max operation and a summation at the same time. And uh, so it takes two arguments back here, one for the max, one for the sum. I'll do the corresponding, uh, corresponding operations in the loop body. Okay, and I have the correctly ordered arguments down here, right? One, the max reducer, and then because the sum is the default, right, uh, or summation is the default, I can just give the result place as the second one. You could also write explicitly Coco sum double here. One thing, this allows you to also mix scalar types, right? So in this case, I want the max and the sum of a arrays of floats, but in order to get a more accurate result for the sum, I'm using doubles, you know, to do the actual summation. Right. So that is fine. Now, one last thing. If you give us a scalar argument, the reduction is a blocking operation. Generally, you should always assume that Cocos operations are non-blocking. So you dispatch them and they may execute at any time. There's something called Cocos colon colon fence, which allows you to wait for outstanding operations. A parallel reduce, if you give it a scalar argument, is blocking though. The reason is that since you provided us just a reference to a scalar, we don't make any expectations about you know, what the lifetime of that guy is. But you can give us also Cocos views as a result place. And that means that the operation potentially is non-blocking. So you dispatch it and the call returns before the reduction is actually finished. The idea here being that if you gave us Cocos views, uh, you hopefully manage the lifetime of these guys such that you, know, uh, you wait for any outstanding operations before you deallocate them. You can actually provide views to host memory or to the memory execute, uh, accessible by the execution space for reduction, right? So in this case, you see I'm executing a range policy in CUDA. 
but you can give me, you know, either a host space or a, or a, a CUDA space view. And you can give these guys either to read users or you can give them directly, right? If you give them directly, you get definitely a sum. If you give them to a reducer, you get something else potentially. One thing is if you give that thing to the reducer, you also have to give a memory space as an additional template argument uh, to, the, to the reducer. Okay. Note that while I say potentially non-blocking, uh, that absolutely depends on the execution space. Like OpenMP is never non-blocking because that's not how OpenMP works. Uh, CUDA largely is. In some cases, we might have screwed up and there's an extra fence in there. There is some other caveats around it, you know, which make operations uh, potentially blocking. But this is what you should expect generally. Okay. So with that, we come to the end of today's module. Uh, Let's, let me give you a bit of a summary of what we did today. So we started today with learning about Cocos views. We learned that these things are multidimensional arrays. They can have compile time and runtime dimensions and they are reference counted. So they behave like, uh, they largely behave like uh, standard shared pointers to an array. Here's a little example. So we create that view. We create in this case a two dimensional view with one runtime and one compile time dimension. And you have to give a constructor a label and the runtime dimensions. And then you access it with a parent fields operator. We learned about execution spaces. We learned that parallel operations execute in a specified execution space. You can control that by a template argument to an execution policy. And if you do not provide an execution policy, uh, you know, explicit execution policy with a template argument, then it's executing in the default execution space. We learned about memory spaces and that views store their data in memory spaces. You can provide a memory space as a template parameter to a view. If you do not provide a memory space, uh, what happens is that the view allocates in, or in the Cocos default execution space, column, column, memory space. You can use deep copy to transfer data between views. Uh, we do not copy stuff automatically. There are memory spaces which do it for you because the hardware does it for you or something like that. But Cocos itself will not explicitly or will not without your knowledge, you know, like call these kind of uh, deep copies, uh, mem copies. Okay. We also learned about layouts. We learned that Every view has a layout and that layout determines the mapping of its multiple multi-index to the underlying memory location. We are provided as a template parameter. If you do not provide a layout, it is derived from the execution space associated with, it mem with the memory space of a view. And uh, it's optimized such that if you paralyze over the leftmost index, your accesses are good. Um, And the last thing is that we have, we talked about advanced reductions. We talked about parallel reduce defaulting to summation and that you can co use Cocos reducers to, uh, you know, do other operations. You can actually write your own reducers. You know, you just need to look at how these are implemented, but we actually provide uh, information about that in our API wiki. You can also do reductions over multiple values. That's a relatively new feature, only supported in Cocos Develop at this point, and will be part of the, Cocos, of the next Cocos release 3.2. Uh, we also learned that only reductions into scalar arguments are guaranteed to be synchronous. Okay, with that, we are at the end for today. Next week, we're going to talk about a bit more advanced data structures. We will talk about, you know, how to do subsetting and slicing of views. We'll talk about some higher level and spe special purpose view abstractions, which are really useful for a lot of people. We'll talk a bit about atomic access to view data. We're also going to introduce a new execution policy 
a multidimensional loop policy called MD range policy. Uh, don't forget, you know, join our Slack channel if you have questions. Drop into our office hours on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. The links to that will be again at the updates for the Cocos lecture. There's a short link down here. The recordings are available, uh, will be available shortly also for this module in the uh, wiki on the tutorial. With that, we are at our end for today. I hope I see you all next week again. And uh, we can still stay on for a little bit longer for more questions. But if not, you know, come to our jo join our Slack channel and ask us there. Thank you all. Okay, Osni, I think we can stop recording. Stop.